my happy heart quivers, I'll tell you that right now. And so I don't drink very much of it. Revelation chapter 20. Let's stand together, please, read God's Word. We're going to dive right in this tonight. Speaking tonight on the millennium, on the millennium. Verse number 1, I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and the great chain in his hand, laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Amen. Amen. He gets better here. Cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more. Because a thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus, for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received upon their foreheads or in their hands. They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. The rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death hath no power. By the way, that's you and I. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. He shall go out and deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. By the way, that's spectacular. You wonder how in the world could everybody... Going into the millennium saved, and yet Satan is able to pull out this great number. I'll show you tonight. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about in the beloved city. The fire came down from God out of heaven, devoured them. And here's the good verse, verse 10. The devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Somebody say amen right there. <laughs> That's what I have written down. Jump up and down on the lid of hell right there. It's saying, you old devil. And I saw a great white throne, him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no more place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. The books were open, and another book was open, which is the book of life. The dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. The sea gave up the dead which were in them, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. They were judged, every man according to their works, and death and hell were cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I'll draw your attention to verse number 4. Let's read that together in unison. Verse 4, ready? And I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. A thousand years of peace, prosperity, and quiet. A thousand years called the millennium, the kingdom age. It's a time when God will show mankind the way it should have always been. Let's pray together. Father, bless now, please, the reading of your word. Challenge us, Lord, tonight. May we all be thinking of others that we can get to you, please. And help us, as Timothy was commanded, to do the work of an evangelist, we ask you, please, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. At this point, the Apostle John has now been able to see the winding down of the seven-year tribulation period. It was a great tribulation. Christ has made His second coming, entrance to earth in chapter 19, leading the saints of God on white horses to confront Antichrist's world government. The battle of Armageddon has now been fought with Christ smiting the nations of this world with the word of His mouth. Spectacular victory. Not one casualty in the Lord's army as bodies are stacked on Satan's side for the vultures to eat. The end of chapter 19. The beast and the false prophet that Satan so dastardly used to deceive the nations are captured and they are now in the lake of fire. Now something even more spectacular is about to happen. We see first of all that Satan is captured and bound 
for 1,000 years, verses 1 through 3. Satan is captured and bound for 1,000 years. One of heaven's mighty angels is the arresting officer. He has the keys to the bottomless pit in his hand. He has a great, you might say, supernatural chain in the other hand. The identity of Satan is revealed through his names. I want you to look at this in chapter, in verse number 2. It says, He laid hold on the dragon, the old serpent, which is the devil, and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Why didn't he say he laid his hand on Satan? Well, I think that God wanted to make sure that all of us got the right man. Amen? And his name means something. The word dragon speaks of his grossness and his literal terrifying image. And sometimes we understand that Satan... Uh, is also pictured as a, an angel of light. And, and he's not always in his grotesque form, but literally his vis visage is that of something that's very, very grotesque, very scary, very terrifying, which is to say, I don't know why we want to let our children play with these scary-looking beasts that Hollywood actually helps uh, the toy manufacturers produce. Get G.I. Joe out. I was going to say, Barbie, we better just move on right there. I'll tell you what, move on. We're going to have to go back to Raggedy Ann. Somebody say man right there. Then probably something's wrong with her. But anyhow, I'm just saying that uh, uh, Satan is depicted as a dragon. He's pictured as that old serpent. Why is it phrased that old serpent? It is phrased that way to remind us of Genesis. And back in Eden, it was a serpent that Satan entered to uh, defile and to uh, tempt Adam and Eve there. Then he's called the devil and uh, speaks of his, uh, his uh, demonic and satanic ways, his diabolical nature, and the wickedness and perversion that he has caused the planet. And then an unusual name is given here at this point. It's a name we've heard before. But he uses the name Satan. Why did he use the name Satan? It was his heavenly name given to him before this prideful fall reminding him of where he came from heaven, reminding him of his choice position as an archangel, the anointed cherubim that covereth. And there was uh, no one closer to God in heaven besides the Son of God. Satan was right there, getting his obeisance there before God. And also reminding him that it didn't have to be this way. It didn't have to be this way, Satan. It wasn't this way for Michael, the archangel. It wasn't this way for Gabriel. It wasn't this way for two-thirds of the angels. I mean, they kept their mouths shut. They did what they were supposed to do. And they worshiped God in a genuine way. But you chose, you chose this route. This is your doings when you lifted up your hand against God with all that arrogance and pride. And now look at the mess you caused. God got his right man. He's cast into what the Bible calls a bottomless pit and some say the bottomless pit is equivalent to hell however closer study reveals that it is some form of holding area for demonic activity I don't know all the ins and outs of this I don't I don't uh, promote myself as a prophetical theologian but the word here is the abyss the Greek word abyss a little different from Hades different from Gehenna the lake of fire Revelation 9 it appears that Satan has some control over this bottomless pit. I want you to turn back. Look at Revelation chapter 9. Let me just read this to you here for those who have some interest in this. Look at uh, chapter 9, Revelation verse 1. Chapter 9, Revelation verse 1. The fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. Some say this was the sun of the morning. The day star, Satan always tries to mock or tries to imitate the Lord Jesus Christ. Isaiah 14, 12. This star fell from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there arose a smoke out of it as a smoke of a great furnace. And the sun and the air were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. There came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and unto them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. Going down, it talks about how these scorpions were supernatural in some form. They destroyed and killed a lot of people. Skip down, look at verse number 11. They had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue was Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue, 
hath his name Apollyon, which means destroyer. And so many believe that possibly this was some, uh, some holding area for demonic activity. In Revelation 9, or 11, 7 and Revelation 17, 8, we understand that it is the beast had access to this pit. Some uh, believe that the beast actually comes from this pit. But now the keys, whoever had them, are returned to God, and they're handed to this angel who binds Satan and unlocks this area and casts him into what becomes a prison house. Look over at verse number 7. Again, the Bible says, When the thousand years are expired, Satan was loosed out of his prison. So this is some type of a prison house for the demons and for Satan and so forth. He is chained there, which means there's no coming and going. There is a seal set upon him so that if he moves, God knows, and it lets you know there's a time for his exit from the place. Uh, he'll not be able to see the nation any longer. Praise God for that. He is accuser of the brethren right now. Uh, the spirit of Antichrist is right now, and Satan is the great deceiver. I, I think about some of the sins of the world. I think about how in the world could anybody be involved in that type of sin. I'm going to tell you how Satan deceives them. And so we understand that he's the great deceiver. He'll do it no more. Uh, and uh, uh, the Bible says that uh, he'll be loosed for a season at the end of a thousand years. Some of you say, um, why does God do that? I, I don't know. I'm going to tell you why I think. I'm going to tell you what other theologians uh, uh, say that agree with me on this. But there, understand that there are people born during this thousand year reign. I'm going to get this in just a moment in a bigger way. They'll never know what it feels like to be tempted by de the devil. Some of them, many of them will make decisions for Christ. But some will be put to the test. God only loses Satan one last time, I believe, to prove that these people will truly believe in God as the ruler of the universe. And you will see that he is once again successful in gathering an army as a sand of the sea. We'll talk about that more in a later, later on. Understand that going into this thing that the seed of sin that is the seed of Adam is still in mankind even in the millennial age. And even after Satan is off the face of the earth, Adam's sinful blood still courses in man's veins. Someday it will be dealt with and all things will be made new. But on this point, these people have a problem with that. Now, you and I will not. We're saved. We're already up there. We're not necessarily having children. We're not procreating. We're there judging the world. I'll show you in a moment. But we understand this, that men understand what sin is without the help of Satan. Satan's not even here to this time. He's bound. But men still will sin during this thousand-year reign. And by the way, the, everything that you do this wrong, the devil doesn't make you do it. Your nature from Adam makes us do it. We are all born into sin. Romans says like this, Wherefore is by one man sin entered in the world, and death by sin, so then death is passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You ever thought about this? You don't have to teach your children how to sin. They figure it out real quick. Even when they're small, they'll deceive you. I won't even go there. Everybody that is except my grandson. He don't fall into that category. I'm just kidding. I mean, he's a stinker just like everybody else. And uh, look for the day he's saved, which, by the way, is a prayer that I, my wife and I pray every day. And you ought to pray for your kids every day that they come to Christ. Amen. Number two, we see the saints of Christ rule with him for 1,000 years. Verses 4 through 6. The saints of Christ rule with him for 1,000 years. It is amazing what this world will be like when Satan is gone. I don't think we really understand the oppression that you and I are under. It is called the kingdom years, meaning millennium, 1,000. This is a time that all the prophets wrote about. Here in Revelation, John just speaks in a general fashion. Because the Bible has a lot to say about this. Millennial ways, Jesus talked about it. Zechariah talked about it. Isaiah talked about it. Ezekiel talked about it. Micah, Joel, most all of the Old Testament prophets talked about the kingdom age because this is what the Israelites were excited about. I want to read. I have, I have a whole stack of commentaries on the book of Revelation. Some good ones. Ironside is a good one. I picked this one up several weeks ago, written by commentator John Phillips. A good man. John Phillips spent his last years in Brother Bobby Robertson's church. Brother Bobby had his funeral just about three years ago. He's a fantastic commentator. Anything you can get a hold of by John Phillips or, or John Butler, you ought to get a hold of it. I want to read. This was just captivating me. That's long. But I want to read for you for just a while. 
how John Phillips explains the millennial age. Listen to this. They call it the golden age. It's come now. The armies of the nations have been disbanded and the great military academies has fallen into ruin and decay. The machinery of war has all been smelted down and converted to the implements of peace. Jerusalem has become the world's capital. The throne of David is there. The uh, 12 apostles are there judging the 12 tribes of Israel. For Israel rules the world. The millennial temple has been built to the uh, crown of Moriah's brow. And the nations of the earth come there to worship the living God. All of us will do that. You say, I'm, I'm afraid to go to Israel. Well, there'll come a day when you won't be afraid to go to Israel. We're going to all go there. How are we going to get there? Trust me, you'll have a body get you there. Me, George Jetson. Na, 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 na. Anyway, yeah, I don't know how we're going to get there. Prosperity is evident from pole to pole and from the new river which now graces Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. Poverty is unknown. Every man has all that, all that his heart can desire. There are no prisons. There are no hospitals, no mental institutions, no barracks, no saloons, no houses of ill repute, no gambling dens, no homes for the aged or infirmed. Such things belong to the past and a lesser age. The bloom of youth is on everyone's cheek. For man is a stripling at a hundred years of age. Cemeteries are crumbling relics of the past, and tears are rare. The wolf and the lamb, the calf and the lion, the cow and the bear, the child and the scorpion are all at peace. Jesus has come, and the millennium is here. The golden age, so frequently heralded by the prophets of Israel's past, has dawned at last, and the earth is filled with the knowledge of God. Jesus is Lord, and He rules the nations with a rod of iron. His reign is righteous, and the nations obey. And the principles of the Sermon on the Mount are the laws of the kingdom, and men obey them because infractions are not allowed. Sin is visited with swift and certain judgment, and this ear lasts for exactly 1,000 years. Now that's just the icing on the cake. You and I have no idea how wonderful the 1,000 years will be. That is, not even the, that is not even heaven eternal. We're going to read about that in chapters coming up. But here we have the New Testament saints uh, are seen by John as sitting on thrones. We started out with this thought in Revelation 1-6, the first part of the book, and he hath made us to be kings and priests unto God and to his Father and, to be him, and him to be glory and dominion forever and ever. I mean, right in the very first chapter he tells us we're headed for a kingdom. And that kingdom will be ruled and reigned by the King of kings and Lord of lords. And someday every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And you and I shall reign as kings and priests. Uh, Jesus spoke about his kingdom often and how he would rule. We would rule and reign with him. The Old Testament saints are there according uh, to this, uh, these first three verses. The New Testament saints are there. Uh, the next four verses I should say. Tribulation saints are there. The ones that were some of them beheaded for the cause of Christ. They did not receive the, the mark of the beast in their hands and, and in their foreheads. Praise God for those strong, stalwart Christians. I just want to stop and say this. You and I are reading about tribulation saints that's going to put up with this, some of the most terrifying events in history while you and I are sitting up there at the Lamb's Supper. While we're up there at the judge seat of Christ looking down on this mess, they are suffering terrible, terrible events. And you may say, well, they should have came to Christ earlier, and they should have. But thanks be unto God for men and women that get saved during that time that hold their stand for God. And can you and I not stand in this age of productivity, in this age of success, in this age of all the wonderful things that we're able to have as a church? Can we not stand? I think about how these people are hurt so deeply. The Bible says that these that judge are judging in literal bodies. They were given authority to judge the nations made up of all uh, left on planet earth and, and all that would be born. Verse 5 states that the bodies of the unsaved dead lie dormant in their graves while uh, later they'll be summoned at the end of this chapter to meet their souls and be reunited. I just want to stop and say, according to verse 6, you ought to thank God that you're born again because because you're born again you'll be part of the first resurrection which the second death has no power over. 
Everyone that's raised at the second resurrection spend eternity in the lake of fire. That brings me to number three. Verses 7 through 10, Satan is loosed and leads his last rebellion against God. Let's look at this again. When the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. He shall go out to see the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. They went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the earth of the saints about the beloved city, that is Jerusalem, by the way, and fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Look at this. Satan is loosed for a season. He begins to search the four corners of the earth looking for those who will follow him north, east, south, west. He looks everywhere. He finds them, finds a big crowd. It is my understanding, according to Isaiah 60, 21 and Joel 2, 28, it's my understanding that all who enter the millennial period alive will be redeemed. However, Remember that man will still procreate. In an Eden-like, you might say, environment, can you imagine how quickly this world will repopulate with no one dying? Now, I want you to think about this. There are no more wars, no more disease, no more typhoons, no more earthquakes like in Ecuador. Pastor Ezekiel Salazar, pastor's out in California. His daughter was here this morning with her husband, their little baby. She was telling me Pastor Salazar and his wife are over in Ecuador right now. And she said, Pastor, it's much, much worse than you ever hear on the news. They're over there trying to win people to Christ. There'll be no more Ecuadors. Be no more big tidal waves that take out the whole coast of Japan. No Zika virus. The Bible says no more wars. The world would be forced to beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks, according to Joel and Malachi. The Bible states that Jesus rules from David's throne with a rod of iron. Well, why is that necessary? Because everything's not perfect. Because this world will quickly repopulate. You and I are not having children. You and I are ruling the earth. I got my little spot picked out. I'm going to ask the Lord to rule. It's not Woodbury either. <laughs> but nevertheless, we're ruling with the Lord. Obviously, there will be some rebellion in the millennium because of that necessity to rule. But it is quickly crushed by those of us who rule and reign with Christ. Let me just say it like this. Today, Satan has the upper hand. And he is persecuting the Christian. But one of these days, the tables are going to be turned. God's going to have the upper hand and rule with a rod of iron. But that does not mean that everybody believes. Remember that Adam nature that's in everybody. These children are all born with that same Adam nature uh, that all human beings have. And no doubt many will believe, but many will not believe. Again, get the picture. There is no death rate. It's all birth rate. It is a very prosperous society. Everybody is happy. These children come along. They have no idea of what it's like to be tempted by Satan. You and I live with that every single day. Because of this, Satan is able to tempt and deceive many. A huge army has gathered, the Bible says here, as the sands of the sea. Satan's huge army surrounds the beloved city, that city of Jerusalem, which he hates. It's a place just outside those walls, a place called Calvary place called Golgotha, where he received the mortal wound on Calvary that he never recovered from. He gathers around that city. I was reading just an article this past week that I'd saved back in a file, and I, I was reading that, and, and the several statements have been made to me this past week. They said, Preacher, it's just moving so fast. It's moving so fast. It said an ESPN announcer was fired from his job for making Statements against the bathroom bill. I don't, I don't know the guy, but I don't know what he said. So it, it sounded like it wasn't that nice, but the position was right. Right here in own state of Tennessee, all the things we've got battling, we're battling right now. Guys, let me just tell you something. I understand that our government vetoed the Bible being our state book. 
And I suppose I understand why he politically said he did it. But there are other reasons why he was doing that. The, the legislator was bringing that up. Turn me off for just a minute. And so they gather this big army, and Satan's huge army surrounds the beloved city. He's always Jerusalem. Islam hates Jerusalem. And uh, this is the capital city of Christ's kingdom. God himself, I like this, comes down out of heaven, and destroys all of Satan's army with fire. Boom! It's over. <laughs> That's how God does it. That's how he could do you right now if he wanted to. That's how he could do me if he wanted to. But thank God we're living in the age of grace. Then I love this. Let's read this out loud, verse 10. Let's read that together because you ought to circle that, put stars around that, verse number 10. Read it, read it out loud. Ready? And the devil that deceived them was cast in the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Ladies and gentlemen, Hollywood has it all wrong. The devil don't torment anybody in hell. God torments him forever. And everyone that spends eternity in hell or torment in the same way. Number four. We see now a very, very sad portion of Scripture, the great white throne judgment of the unsaved. The Bible says in verse 11, I saw this. The Apostle John says, I saw this with my own eyes. It's like God fast-forwarded time and allowed him to sit there in that vision and watch what the great white throne judgment was like. Here's how he deal, detailed it. Jesus is the one whom has been put in charge of this terrible judgment. And by the way, God has vested all judgment in the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's kind of a strange thing because the Lord Jesus, they said that when you looked on him, that he was <clears throat> a very humble looking person. And I don't agree with all the paintings that were done in the 14th, 15th, 16th century, you know, and how they make Jesus appear and so forth. But they said that, that Jesus walked and talked to a very meek person. And I want you to read this because there's, there's some heart in this, emotion in this. It says, And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it from whose face the earth and heaven fled away. There was no place found for them. There are different ideas of what that means. But here's what I think it means. All of the people that get to this place, they have to look on the face of Jesus Christ. By now they won. They understand that He's the one that they slew. They will look on Him whom they have pierced. He doesn't have a face of anger. But the Bible is indicating here that when they look on him, they just want to, they, they can't, they, they want to get away from him. They can't look on him. They want to get away from him. But there's no place to get away from him. That face. 
is there, the last thing he'll ever see before they're cast in the lake of fire. I believe it was King Zedekiah that when the Babylonians finally came and overrun the last king there in Jerusalem, tore down the walls and destroyed the city and hauled off the last bunch. I believe it was King Zedekiah. I think that was his name. The Bible says they brought King Zedekiah up in front of his executioner, lined up all of his sons and killed them before his very eyes. Then the Babylonian executioner chose not to kill Zedekiah but put his eyes out. The last thing Zedekiah saw was his sons killed before his very eyes. I'm painting a picture here for you. That picture is that these people come before Jesus and it's a, it's a ghostly look. They, they, they know what's coming and they can't look on him. John sees all of this, the dead, small and great, stand before him, the kings and the pompers. They are judged out of the book of life. The Bible says the books were open, plural, and another book was open, which is the book of life. The other books were probably, one would have probably been the word of God, which proves sin. The law is a schoolmaster to bring us to Jesus. You and I, uh, Paul said, we would not know what was right and wrong apart from the scriptures. We understand what that is. And so, obviously, this will be one book that's laid out. And in that throne, in that judgment, they'll show you did this, you did this, you did this, you did this, you, did, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, you didn't do this, because nobody's going to get out of it. The books were open, another book was open. Somebody says the, uh, the, other, the other books could have been not just the Bible, but could have been those books where the accounting, the account is made in heaven. And understand that everything that you and I do is written in heaven. They'll be forgotten. No Christians are judged here. They would have already been judged at the judgment seat of Christ. No one goes to hell at the judgment seat of Christ, the Bema seat. Everybody goes to hell at the great white throne judgment. The Bible says here that the books was open, which is the book of life. It says uh, they were judged out of those things that were written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up their dead, which were in it. Death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them. They were judged every man according to their works. Death and hell was cast in the lake of fire. This is the second death. The Bible says here the sea gave up her dead. Death or the grave gave up the dead. Understand the process of death. Now I've preached on this many times, but it comes into play right here. This is very, very important. I'm almost finished. Stick with me. When a born-again Christian dies, his body goes back to the dust as everyone's. But his soul goes immediately to be with the Lord in heaven, absent from the body, present with the Lord. We're given the glorified body there to await the rapture. And when the rapture occurs, the trump of God sounds. The Bible says, And dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall ever be, ever be with the Lord. You say, wait a minute. They're in the grave. They're in heaven. Yeah, yeah. And the Bible says that the rapture of the trump of God, that body comes right up out of that grave, splits that ground wide open, comes up, and boom, they're reuniting with their soul in heaven. And you and I, they're alive around, if we were standing around a graveside, and that would happen. That person, if they were born again, they'd rise. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together them in the clouds and meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be the Lord. <clears throat> so it's the same, but on a more judgmental side for the unsaved. Unsaved person dies, boom. They go to the grave. Their body goes to Hades. Hell is the word Hades here. But then at the second resurrection, their body is called back from the grave, reunited with that soul that was in a holding place called Hades. They're judged out of the book. Their name's not found in the book, and they're cast in the lake of fire. That Greek word is Gehenna. That is eternal fire. We're a little familiar with that. If you and I are uh, convicted of a crime, or let's say we're arrested for a crime, we go to jail. Jail is the holding place until you're judged. Once you're judged and condemned, 
Then you go to prison. Prison is the more eternal place. And you could be there for life depending on the crime. The same is true with Hades and Gehenna. I'm not trying to make any big difference because they're both bad. And nobody wants to go there and somebody say amen. But here the same thing happens. And by the way, God's not going to miss anybody. And I want to I say several things right here. I don't mean to sound offensive. But I want to be very, very clear. The Bible says a sea gave up their dead. What does that mean? Do you understand how many people over the centuries are dead at sea? Wars and typhoons and only the Lord knows all the history of mankind. People being washed out to sea. I think about all those people in Japan. That when that big uh, typhoon came, uh, uh, the, the tsunami, that they, they've never found them. Never be found. God knows where they are. God knows where every one of them is at. Now listen very carefully. People that have been in the graves for years, I will not go in the process of the grave. I will not be unkind or disrespectful. It is what it is. There are people buried that even people don't even know where they're at. God knows right where they're at. Years ago in West Virginia, there was a state trooper. He and his wife were having severe difficulties with their marriage. She was a beautiful lady. All of a sudden, she came up missing. And most everybody felt like her husband killed her. They had a whole lot of evidence, but they didn't have a body. As far as I know, they've never found this body this day, and that man still walks scot-free. But God knows right where that body's at. Now let me turn up a notch. Everybody set still here. If you think that you can burn your body through cremation and never think you have to stand before God because nobody knows judgment, you got another thing coming. Because if God can bring back bodies from the sea and God can bring back bodies from death, God will bring you back. God is the God of the atom. God is the God of the molecule. And ladies and gentlemen, you and I have no business doing our bodies like that. You and I should do our bodies like Jesus did it. Are we okay right now? There is this pagan thought. The cremation comes out of. The pagans did that in the Old Testament. Their idea was no body, no judgment. It doesn't work like that. Let's get it right. Amen? I'm almost done. The sea gave up her dead. The souls of the unsaved are summons from hell. They're reunited there at the, at the great white throne judgment. These are all cast in the lake of fire, eternal hell. And then we have what I believe is the saddest verse in the Bible, verse number 15. Read it with me together in unison. Verse 15, ready? And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. That word whosoever is a haunting word. Because it could have very easily been this, and whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We used to sing a song, Whosoever meaneth me. God wants to save anybody and everybody that will come to him. And the people that will stand there could have been saved. I want to ask you this tonight. Who are you trying to keep out of hell? We can jump up and down and shout glory hallelujah that someday Satan's done and I cannot even imagine the pressure that will be off my life when there's no more Satan. But that is only because I receive the gift of God which is eternal life. I would never ever get to experience that and you wouldn't either if it wasn't for the fact that we got born again one day. And everybody here, everybody deserves a chance to hear the gospel. Who is it right now that God wants you to keep out of hell? Let me say that again. Who is it right now that God wants you to keep out of hell? By giving them the gospel. Let's stand together. Please, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed, and thank you for your attention tonight. I'm going to ask you right now to get a name.